to another wonderful IHR event, one of the last in the semester. And we want to bring your attention to our upcoming public event, which is a book talk by Rebecca Solnit. Uh, reception and signing for her very new book, Not Too Late, which will be April 27th. You can tell it on our website. Um, and we have two more events, including this one, which are World in Pre-Christians by Ron Berlio, our director, and I just reminded him of our staff for some really wonderful things um, and write books and think about words and love words. Uh, so next Tuesday, we have the final ASU Humanities Faculty Book Talk. Um, with a number of our wonderful colleagues, that's at 11, um, Ross Blakely. And uh, today we have our final Do You Have a Word for That? Um, in which uh, our faculty uses uh, their, their faculty, and I see what I just said, um, in order to uh, discuss layers of meaning of words. And then so today we have Stacey Moran. Who yeah, is an assistant professor in the School of Art, Media, and Engineering, as well as holding appointments in the Herberg Art Institute um, and in several uh, areas within the English department. And her work lies at the intersections of feminist theory and techno sciences, design studies, and critical pedagogy. And her current research investigates how methods in the physical sciences provide a foothold for thinking about the materiality of knowledge production. Um, and among her many other uh, ventures, she is the editor of the Technical Journal and Associate Director of the Center for Philosophical Technology. So Stacy. Uh, we also have Ruben Espinosa, who is Associate Professor of English and Associate Director of the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. Um, his work engages with Shakespeare through the lens of critical race and ethnic studies. Um, Professor Espinosa's research interrogates the intersections of Shakespeare and Chicanet's culture and identity. Um, his most recent book is Shakespeare on the Shades of Racism. And we also have Mike Tuller, who is Professor of Classics and Interim Chair of the School of International Letters and Culture. And his work on Hellenistic poetry. Um, he works on Hellenistic poetry, Greek poetry, the period just after Alexander the Great, and especially on Epic uh, which he notes can be about death, love, art, gifts to the gods, and he adds, really anything else. <laughs> um, so at present, he is doing many things, including editing an edition and facing page translation of the largest collection of these epigraphs. Um, uh, and he also is a teacher of readings to his creative the highways project. Um, and he's most known for detailing the techniques by which early poets of the genre, and especially women poets, laid the groundwork for the development of epigrams of their own. Um, and I'm sure you must be editing all of these bios because these people just read too many things in too many ways, and we want to actually really talk about them. Um, so without further ado, we'll begin. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this fun event. Nice, uh, nice break at the end. So today I'm going to talk about a word from the field of physics. Decoherence refers to the process in which the system's behavior changes from something that can be explained by quantum physics to something that can be explained by classical physics. In other words, the situation where some form of interference causes a transition from indeterminacy to one determined locality. This is famously represented by Schrodinger's cat, who seems to live in limbo land between alive and dead states until someone opens the box. Now, we're talking about quantum physics here, and I am no physicist. I'm a rhetorician of feminist techno science. So, but I want you to note that I'm not going to talk about that other quantum verse that has captured the imagination of the humanities and social sciences entanglement. Influenced by Karen Barad's meeting the universe halfway, the term entanglement is showing up in the field as diverse as along with philosophy, anthropology, theology, bioethics, education and curriculum studies, geography, art, music, education, media studies, postcolonial studies, and thanks to a recent article by me, critical design studies. Barad argues that an accurate account of quantum entanglement enhances our understanding of relations between the natural and social worlds between human and non-human and the material and discursive. Their ultimate aim is to formulate 
new grounds for ethical action outside of individualism, representationalism, and humanism. Barack doesn't talk at all about decoherence. In fact, is strangely silent on the matter. I begin my discussion of decoherence by quoting theoretical physicist Richard Feynman, who said that the weirdness of the quantum world is a psychological torment that makes us scratch our heads and ask, but how can it be like that? Feynman also suggested uh, it can't be explained at all, much less to non scientists. Never mind, today I've been tasked with discussing this work in under 10 minutes. <laughs> The quantum universe is as sorry, that's the wrong slide. <laughs> the quantum universe is, as we might say, everywhere. Marvel films, many of which are now set in the quantum universe, are the highest grossing film franchise in the world, grossing about $26 billion to date. The film Everything Everywhere All at Once swept the Oscars this year, the premise of the film being the idea that quantum particles exist in every possible state until measured. In the many worlds interpretation of the measurement problem in quantum physics, every time a measurement takes place, the universe branches into new realities that contain all possible outcomes. In the movie, Evelyn Burt jumps into her other selves in parallel universes in order to save worlds. In any case, this is all fiction and fantasy, of course, <clears throat> while the many worlds is one of 15 mainstream, mind you, interpretations of the measurement problem in quantum physics. There are minor ones too. It's easily the most popular, made so I would add by science media personalities like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Michio Kaku. I will also add that its popularity simply does not correlate with the probability that it is correct, but we can use it as a heuristic device. The question that many worlds and the other interpretations are trying to solve is, what's really happening with particle with wave particle duality. The famous double slit diffraction experiment explains the problem and it looks like the following. When a laser is shot through two slits cut in the wall, waves of light show up on the screen as an interference pattern. And these interference patterns resemble diffracting water waves and always indicate wave behavior. But when matter is sent through slits, for example, grains of sand, they hit the screen light and leave a different pattern called a, a double fan sphere pattern. It reflects the shape of the slits, no interference pattern as you would expect. However, when matter is um, when matter is scaled down to the quantum size and electrons are sent through one at a time, the normal pattern doesn't appear. Instead, what shows up is an interference pattern indicating waves. When it was discovered in the early 20th century that light and matter each demonstrate both particle and wave behavior, it set off a flurry of excitement and controversy, and all manner of debates quickly formed around what is now referred to as wave particle duality. Just to be clear, there is no controversy over the fact that interference leads to the collapse of a wave into a particle. When Feynman said that no one really understands quantum physics, what he meant was that no one understands the precise relationship between the classical and the quantum realms. The debate isn't about the role of the observer, spooky action at a distance, or God playing dice. These popular notions just don't concern physicists. What concerns them is the nature of what collapse means. That is, in what sense can we understand that a wave collapses into a particle? Is the universe composed of waves? Or is the wave function just that, a mathematical tool, something that tells us nothing about the nature of the universe? This is the thrust of the debate. Is the collapse real? That is, can it be proven empirically? And does it describe what the world fundamentally is? Or is it merely formal? In other words, mathematical. And is the field of physics of the world or describing the world? These matters are highly contested in quantum mechanics. And the fact is, after 100 years of debate, no one really knows. The etymological origins of the word collapse are instructive for framing the scope of the measurement problem, stemming from the Latin verb labor labulapsis, meaning to lose one's footing, to slip or fall, therefore also to go to ruin. Um, perhaps worth mentioning that the noun form is feminine and means disaster or debacle. The collapse connotes a fall or loss from wave to particle and encourages the belief in two things. First, the ontologically prior status of the quantum as that from which the classical falls. This is misleading since, in fact, not all entities operate according to quantum laws, and the inconsistencies remain unaccounted for. To say that all classical things emerge from quantum things is premature. 
Second, it privileges the scale of the quantum over the classical, which is also misleading. Quantum entities are not just scaled down versions of big things. They operate by altogether different logics. Additionally, even using the term collapse to describe the transition is problematic, not only because it uses classical terminology to describe quantum things, which are technically not things at all, although Niels Bohr says we can't avoid that, but also because this rendering makes it conceptually easier to correlate the fall of a particle as ontologically real, when it might be purely mathematical. Of course, the moral and religious connotations of the fall can't be ignored either, and they add another layer of signification to the chain, whereby the behavior of subatomic particles is infected with philosophical and cultural hierarchies, such as mind, body, spirit, flesh, and then even as Hales and others point out, information, embodiment, and so on. Of course, I'm relying here on my rhetoric of science predecessors, Evelyn Fox Keller, Emily Martin, Nancy Steffen, to illuminate the productivity of language as it travels across academic disciplines, as well as across registers of empirical science and culture. Language is not just describing the science, but plays a role in its very production. But here's an interesting twist. In the, I forgot where my slide show is. Okay, and here's an interesting twist. In the 1970s, a physicist named Dieter Z renamed the collapse decoherence because he said that although decoherence is a normal consequence of interacting systems, misunderstanding of its meanings seemed to persist. Z used decoherence on a different register, not to refer to the interference that causes the so-called collapse of the wave or even its loss of coherence, but instead as a general concept. Decoherence names now the study of the transition itself, the nature of the relation between two systems. This is the key point. In the re renaming and reconceptualizing something like a transition event, we get an example in physics of what Gaetri Spivak called the first right of refusal. That is the right to refuse the choices as offered. Rather than forcing a non-choice between realism and formalism, decoherence zooms out and reframes the debate. In Z's words, still many physicists are convinced to see the particle in the cloud chamber or on the screen, thereby, thereby accepting classical particle coordinates as due to the reality. But what one concludes to see depends on the chosen model of reality. And this model can only be judged by describing the observations, therefore interpolating them. Now, I don't want to mislead you because Z does have an interpretation of the measurement problem, and it even relies on the many world theory. My research explores those physicists who have dared to ignore the dictum shut up and calculate. And instead, allowing for the field of physics to uh, sorry, my research explores those physicists who have dared to ignore the diction, shut up and calculate, and instead allow the field of physics to be tainted by messy foundational questions that most argue don't belong there. The messy, this messy mode of inquiry insists that there is no neutral way of presenting research. In the very telling, each description reveals its priorities, its stance on a problem. As a tool, then, decoherence presents not the problem, but opens up an entire problematic, a space where questions and multiple perspectives hover between realms. And I use the concept as a rich space for theorizing the language of physics and the mattering of language. Thanks. That was fantastic. Um, so yeah, I want to echo thanks for the invitation to be here. And uh, admittedly, my talk is far less scientific. Uh, uh, so full, full disclosure, the reason I chose this word is because I was asked by Buble to take over an edited collection on Shakespeare and skin. So skin studies are not necessarily my field, but I've been learning a lot about it in the process. Um, so before I arrive at my chosen word, I, I want to contextualize my research foci. Um, so as mentioned, I, I look at Shakespeare from critical race and ethnic studies, and, and some of my work has focused on race and racism in and through Shakespeare, and with real focus on our contemporary moments, um, and as well as the intersections of Shakespeare and Japanese culture. But at the core of my research, I'm, I'm thinking through who is perceived to have legitimate access to Shakespeare and why, and the idea of what Shakespeare should look like and what Shakespeare should sound like 
often informs these notions and is tethered to notions of white supremacy. And as such, skin, um, and specifically the color of skin, matters both in early modern England and in our contemporary society. So if you're hoping for me to do a deep dive into the etymology of skin or even something grounded in historical context, I am sorry to disappoint you today. Uh, you can look at the OED for that, uh, but as Don and Hope detailed, you know, at the last event, that's not necessarily accurate. And in fact, right, it can help bolster myth making when it comes to prominent dead white men, including Shakespeare. Uh, he's trying to debunk that myth, right? So my work is firmly situated in contemporary engagements with Shakespeare. I am, however, interested in examining how Shakespeare's work itself attends to the notion of skin. And so I want to offer two brief examples before considering the stakes behind focusing on skin. And the first example is through one of Shakespeare's most iconic of plays, Hamlet. So when Hamlet considers the materiality of the human body as he witnesses the grave figure hollowing out Ophelia's grave, he asks how long a man will lie in the earth ere he rots. And if you remember this is the central moment where ultimately he's holding Yorick's skull, right? We get that kind of famous image of Hamlet with the skull in his hand. Uh, the great figure answers, in faith, if you do not run before he die, he will last you some eight years or nine years. A tanner will last you nine years. The joke, of course, is that the tanner skin would be able to keep water out longer because like the animal hide the tanner treats, it is the tan. The scene focused on death and decaying Right, he attempts to, you know, figures like Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great, right, draws attention to the permanence and impermanence of the human body, and skin signifies the entry point to its durability and its vulnerability. In other words, Hamlet, the play, is deeply invested in having its audience think about death and afterlife, and about the tenuousness behind it all. We might imagine Lawrence Olivier or Kenneth Branagh or Jude Law or David Tennant or a number of nice looking white men, right? Uh, delivering these lines. And, and they're right. Our skin is impermanent. Our existence is tenuous. But where vulnerability is concerned, skin tone matters. I want to juxtapose how vulnerability and skin is pre presented in this iconic play against the way it is treated in the perhaps lesser known yet, from my perspective, much more dynamic play, Titus and Donicus. It is a play that Ayanna Thompson described on NPR as, and I quote, crazy pants. He's right, it offers us, but it offers us a clear entry point considering anti-Blackness and more importantly, Black pride within that play. In Titus, Shakespeare attends to the intersections of malevolence and race to long held beliefs in that period and often in ours that black skin signifies something sinister, that it is contagious. The actions of Aaron the Moor in that play are unequivocally heinous. He is in no uncertain terms a villain in that play. Uh, but more heinous still is the unfettered racism of the white society in which he lies. So take for example, the way it considers skin. Aaron at one point confesses to exhuming the bodies of dead men. So we're back here again to this notion of, of, of emptying graves, right? Uh, exhuming the bodies of dead men to, and I quote, set them upright at their dear friend's door, even when their sorrow almost was forgot. On the skin of these corpses, as on the bark of trees, Aaron carves with his knife, let not your sorrow die, though I am dead. It is an irreverence for the bodies of the dead and those who remember them. And as gruesome as this act might be, it does not compare in my estimation to the utter disregard for human life when it involves those of black of skin in the play and in today's society. Indeed, Aaron's confession to various crimes is a bargaining tool he uses to save the life of his newborn son, the offspring of his affair with the white king's more. Because the baby's skin is black, it marks him as disposable. When the captors hand over Aaron and his baby to Lucius, the white nobleman chastises Aaron and says of the baby, here's the base fruit of that burning lust, this growing image of thy fiend-like face. The long tradition of having the devil portrayed as black on the medieval and early modern stage rears its ugly racist head here. Ultimately, Lucius says of Aaron and his baby, Hang him on this tree, and by his side, this fruit of bastardy. Although this act is never realized, Shakespeare's image of this strange fruit, if you will, 
lynched body, right, of a black father hanging from a tree side by side with a newborn son endures. It is a black skin that undoes them. If you consider the many ways that we attend to the significance of skin is to recognize its prominence when it comes to our interrelatedness to the world and those around us. And I should make clear that skin studies today isn't really grappling with the notion of race. It is more looking at it historically. And so a lot of the contributions to the collection are, are, are have this at the core of their thoughts. But we conceive of our fortitude, thick skin, our insecurities, thin skin, our fragility by the skin of my teeth, our likeness, twin skin, our differences, dark skin, light skin, our commitment to something, skin in the game, our confidence to feel comfortable in your skin, and our utter inhumanity to skin someone, blue skin. Skin is the surface of our bodies, and all too often it is imagined to register something that is inherent in an individual. For many, it is a marker of belonging and unbelonging. But in, the, in that final important consideration of skin as a verb, we see the seriousness of the word. As Lahui Yim explores in her own contribution to the collection I mentioned, the very term skin is triggering for indigenous peoples and carries with it the full weight of Anglo-European settler colonization. So why skin? Because we all collectively need to have skin in the game when we consider how audiences in our plural society Think about simple words like skin. Okay, uh, so the word I'm going to be treating today actually is cosmopolitan, and it's, it's something that derives, I'll admit, much more from my current thinking as a, in administration rather than research. Um, but I am going to be applying uh, the lenses that I normally use in research to it, um, and uh, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so cosmopolitan is a word that originates in Greek. Uh, that this is the the Greek term for cosmopolitan. Uh, and this is, a, this is a compound word, and I'll confess, I primarily chose it because since it's a compound word, that means I get twice the fun. And <laughs> uh, the, the mode that I'm going to use is philology. Uh, so that is what my degree is in, in classical philology. It's a term that's not used all that often anymore, and when it is used, usually pejoratively, uh, but that is what I do. Let me talk just a little bit about what that even is. Um, when you look at a word like philology, it's easy enough to think that it's similar to a word like biology, or I mean, those other logy words that tend to hang around the academy. Uh, for instance, biology uh, etymologically means life study or something like that. Um, actually, a little bit closer to life reason is, is how it would be in, in Greek. Uh, and so surely then uh, philology would be love reasoning. Surely this <laughs> is what I must be studying. Uh, it isn't that. Uh, in fact, this is one of an older set of words uh, like uh, philosophy. Uh, that are formed in a somewhat different way. So I am a philologist, and there's the Greek word for it, philologos, uh, just like a philosopher is a philosophos. Um, and in this case, the operative word is actually the verb. So a philologist is someone who is fond of words. Uh, in the same way that a philosopher is someone who is very literally fond of smarts. Um, by the way, I know I know that sophos is often translated wise. This is one of those symptoms of, of the tendency to translate Greek words in settings like this as if it were 1890. Um, it isn't, however, and there's no difference between wise and smart uh, as far as they are concerned. Uh, attempts to do otherwise probably should be rooted in Dungeons and Dragons and stay there. Um, but anyway, uh, I am a philologist, a person who is fond of words. I've already started talking about this etymologically, so let's talk about the etymology of etymology. Um, first of all, etymology is not entomology, with which it is often a concern, often confused. Entomology, of course, the study of insects. So I've given you a variety of beetles here that you might be able to study 
Um, but yes, it's not that at all. Etymology, etymologically, comes from the Greek word etymos logos, uh, genuine meaning. So logos is a great word. It can be word, it can be reasoning, speech. Uh, it can also be meaning. Uh, and so etymos, the etymos logos uh, is, in Greek, the genuine meaning. Importantly, that is not what etymology means for us. Etymology means word origins. Uh, there's a certain group of people who like to sort of impose some kind of straitjacket on words by which their etymologies should all be what they mean today. That's simply not how words work. Um, and, and so it's instructive when you think about the word etymology to realize that the genuine meaning of etymology is word origins. The word origin of etymology is genuine meaning. Okay, so that is that is how that sets up. Uh, so yes, I am exploring these. Uh, there is, of course, a relation between the two, and that's one of the things that philology does best, um, is explore how we get from one meaning to another uh, without attempting to assume that any of these meanings stay fixed at any point in time. That was just in case you're counting, that was a digression within a digression. But let's <laughs> let's get back to a cosmopolitan. Uh, so the Greek word cosmopolites. Uh, when I break that apart, we do get two Greek names. Uh, so cosmos is one of them, and polites the other. Let's take them one by one, starting with cosmos. Uh, so here's a word that you probably have seen even in English as cosmos, um, and that you might think it means the universe, the world. Uh, something like that. We'll get there. Uh, the basic meaning, however, is order in Greek. Okay, so roughly speaking, order. Uh, now, it so happens that something happened to that word in the way in script through Latin. So Latin also had a word meaning order, uh, which was mundus. Uh, and that word also became associated, just like cosmos did, with the universe or the world. Um, and seeing how that happened provides us with an interesting trip uh, through the way that etymology can uh, reflect meaning today, because cosmos, the Greek word meaning order, which then became world or universe, and mundus, the, Greek, the Latin word meaning order that became world or universe, actually mean very different things. When the Greeks say cosmos, they say order meaning something like element. So in the way that mathematicians are fond of elegant proofs because they lay everything out in order, that is cosmos. Mundus, on the other hand, is, and this is the part where I get to make fun of Romans, which is a hobby for every Hellenist. Uh, mundus means order in the sense that your armor is all polished uh, and you are marching in very straight lines. So in other words, a very sort of Roman way of looking at this. Um, but these are very different kinds of, of order. Uh, and so the, the fact that they came to share this other meaning of, wor of world or, uh, or of universe is what we call a calque. Uh, so a calque in linguistics, so originally this is a French word meaning tracing, but we use it in linguistics to mean an analogized meaning. So since cosmos means order and mundus means order, therefore when cosmos takes on the meaning world, mundus will also take on the meaning world. Uh, so it is a way of using a word in your own language uh, that you then extend the meaning of by analogy to a word in another language that has a, a similar extended meaning. Um, so that's, that's what a calc is. There are lots of ways of adopting concepts from one language and culture into another language or culture. Calc is only one of them. Um, the other uh, popular one is to take a loan word, so actually take the word from the other language itself uh, and bring that word in. Um, so again, just sort of a helpful little note here. Um, calc, which means analogized meaning, is brought into English as a loan word from French, whereas loan word takes the word Lehnwort in German and calcs it into loan word in English. So yes, calc is a loan word and loan word is a calc. Um, so right, I'm hoping that this hasn't gotten too confusing, actually, it's more confusing about it. The, the, um, my favorite 
help, by the way, is in some poems by Catullus uh, in Latin. Um, so there's a Latin word, magnanimus, which means more or less what you think it is. Um, so it literally means having a big spirit, and etymologically means having a big spirit. But yeah, magnanimous. So you get to magnanimous from there in Latin, just like in English. Um, and there's a similar concept in Greek that's essentially the same thing. Uh, that someone has a big spirit, so it's proud or noble, well, close, not, not quite the same. Um, and of course, Catullus, because um, he's one of those poets who likes the truisms, um, uses this word magnanimous as if it meant a different Greek word, because Greek famously has about a dozen words for mind, spirit, soul, whatever that thing is. Um, and so he uses a different one, megatinos, which, yeah, it means big spirit, but big spirit as in really pissed off. Um, so raging, that sort of thing. Um, so using one word to mean its opposite by playing a joke in another language that your poem is not in, um, and that you're you know, hoping your readers will get. I love Catullus so much. Anyway, <laughs> um, all right. So uh, let's get back to cosmopolitan. We've nailed down the first half. Uh, the word originally came into English from French, most directly, as cosmopolite. Um, and cosmos, we nailed down the world part of that. Uh, what is the other part, the polite part? Uh, it doesn't mean polite, perhaps. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, our word polite actually comes from Latin, uh, etymologically meaning polished. Uh, you can see those words are related in English too. So someone who is polished, uh, you would presume that they are polite. Uh, but no, it's not that at all. Uh, this comes from the word politics. Uh, polites itself comes from the word, the word polis. Uh, the word polis, sometime in, in a generation or two ago, tended to be translated city state. Nowadays, we tend to translate it as city. Um, but it does, no one translation is going to suffice because this is one of those very culturally specific words. In the same way that if someone were to ask you how do you translate the word alderman, well, it only means something in the context of the system in which it exists. So you can't really properly translate it without knowing that entire system. So a polis is a system uh, of people who live together in, in what we would probably still call a city, um, but where they also adopt certain social uh, social institutions. And the, you can get together in a city and not have those social institutions. And then the Greeks wouldn't call you a city. I mean, if you don't have, no matter how big you are, no matter how complex, no matter how organized, you're not a city until you've got the institution. You have to have a, uh, a council, you have to have an assembly, you have to have certain educational institutions, etc. cetera, or you're not polis. So that's what a polis is, this complex social organization, something like a city. And taste is just a suffix. It's one of those agent suffixes. So a person who does something. So a, a polites is someone who does the city. What's that? <laughs> uh, well, um, a little hint from Aristotle. Uh, this is an Aristotle quote where if you heard an Aristotle quote, you've probably heard this one, but I've given you a little bit more uh, of the quote than you usually get. Um, and I've also translated a little differently. We, you often hear that like, people are a political animal, uh, which is often, is often taken to this what you mean. It is not working. Because it's working now better? I don't hear this either. Oh, uh, switch it on. You want to have to switch it on. Better? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so you often hear that, that a human being is a political animal. Well, it's often not translated, and most people assume that that means that we're backstabbing SODs. Um, I've translated it the human being is a polis animal. And notice the frame of reference that you apply, because that will tell you what you mean. Uh, more than any bee or any herd animal. So in other words, the ancients tended to classify animals by their social structure. This is one way to classify them. We, they had, we sometimes do this, well, actually, we do still do this today, although we use slightly different words. So there are solitary animals that live by themselves and probably in terms of its mate. There are herds. They get together in large groups, but these are undifferentiated groups. They hang together, they all do the same things. But then there are polis animals. Polis animals have complex social structure. Um, and the ancients did, in fact, classify humans and bees together as animals that have a complex social structure. Um, so that yes, we're in groups of herd animals, but it's more than that. We have this social structure.
sort of piece of design. Um, and this really defines what humans are. That's one of the ways of thinking. We are the most polished type animal. We have the most complex social structures within which we don't, we aren't really human. Uh, with, excuse me, without which we don't really be. So then we get the usual translation for this word, and I've indulged in it myself often as citizen. Um, but I want us to just think a little bit about that word because I'm not convinced that we use it in a helpful way. Um, the word citizen itself, oh, let's etymologize this too while we're at it. Um, so the word citizen comes to us from Anglo Norman um, and essentially means a city dweller that resents or maybe is a dweller or something. So in the same way that a denizen is just somebody who dwells in. So it is simply a dweller. Um, but the reason it didn't really mean that it was an aged verb. It's not as passive as simply dwelling in some place. And you can tell it by the way, by the verb that it comes from. Um, so it should be something more like a city operator with that agent um, suffix. Uh, and this verb, politeo, um, so that ewo suffix really means just to do whatever the noun I'm attached to does, um, means to govern. It doesn't mean to be governed. It means to govern. It is the job of a citizen to govern. Uh, in that respect, it's important to have an opposite for it. it. A citizen is not the same thing as a subject. Now, in modern polities, we do tend to have a great many systems in which there is assumed equality between citizens and subjects. This never applies completely in every polity. It doesn't enough. Um, for instance, many people are resident aliens at this point and do not have are not citizens. Similarly, some people are what we call minors, and while they may be citizens, cannot exercise the rights of citizens. Um, they are subjects. They are subject to the law. They do not get to make them. It is the citizens who make the law. That's what the word means. The citizens govern. Um, I want, I want to just sort of digress on this a little bit. If you, you're trained as what citizenship means, for me, I first understand it, under, started to understand citizenship in my school, where I would get citizenship marks for essentially shutting up. Um, just want to know if that's exactly the opposite of what the Greek word means. <laughs> the Greek word means speaking up. Okay, it means taking a leading role. Um, and to the extent that we believe citizens in our society should shut up and do what they're told, well, we might be getting the Anglo Norman, but it's not what the Greeks would have said. Um, and it's interesting to explore the right to have the citizens and the responsibility to have to be governed. The other thing, by the way, I always have to say about this is that um, there was a there was a courtier in the I'm going to forget his name in the uh, reign of Charles II who claimed to be able to turn the quote up on any subject. Um, and the king then challenged him and said, fine, one on me. And he responded, I can't do that. The king is not a subject, he is the king. Just a reminder what subjects are, those who are subjects to authority as opposed to citizens who exercise it. So when we get to these together, the word cosmopolites was actually used in Greek. The, the, the putting together of these two things did not happen in modernity. Um, so world citizen is something like the idea we have. And when it first occurred in Greek, it was used as the opposite to another word, patriotes. This word has also come into English, patriot. Um, so a patriot is someone who is dedicated to their homeland, who does the things a person dedicated to their homeland would do, whereas a cosmopolites is someone who has the world as their homeland. Um, this was first uh, this word was first propounded by Diogenes the Cynic. Um, so a great philosopher, he did not in fact have a dog. Um, he's always pictured with a dog because cynic means dog-like. Um, so he considered himself a citizen of the world in the sense that he, uh, his motto was in fact, deface the currency. And I have some really great deface currency there, by the way. If you've ever seen a Morgan dollar, that's, that's not what it looks like, which is great. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, his motto was to face the currency. Society screws us up. And so we should get rid of our homelands and instead pledge to humanity. Um, cosmopolitanism does still exist as a philosophical term, very much along the lines that Diogenes defined it. But that's not how most people tend to use it today. 
Here is the frontispiece of the very first issue of Cosmopolitan Magazine. And you notice they've got it right on there. Uh, the world is my country and all mankind are my country. Uh, that was the motto of Cosmopolitan, uh, which was intended to be an educational magazine for the whole family, uh, but mostly for women who it was felt needed it more. Um, the, uh, however, nowadays Cosmopolitan has kind of shifted Switched places with another word. Um, this word, sophos, Mark, that I've already talked about in antiquity also gave birth to, to sophistates, um, which is a term that Plato used. This should mean somebody who makes other people smart, um, but so an educator, but the people that Plato applied it to were people who thought well, it was a very good, very good job. And so I sometimes like to translate this word as Weisenheimer. Um, these, uh, this word came into English from sophistic, somebody who acts like a sophist, who in other words is pretentious, who seems to be getting somewhere but isn't, um, is a sophist and they're making sophistic arguments. And then we got sophisticated, which at first in English meant full of it. <laughs> and now, like I said, to some degree, this word and cosmopolitan have switched places and the things that are sophisticated are complex. Where things that are cosmopolitan are pretentious. As a classicist, I think I'm professionally pretentious, uh, but uh, you can see where that sort of pretense shows. Uh, cosmopolitan, which was a magazine for, to educate women, now believes that the female audience is looking for something different. Um, and this is apparently what they're looking for. Uh, the drink cosmopolitan, admittedly, we're not exactly sure where that comes from, although it's pretty clear that wherever it was created uh, was a gay bar. And so naturally, Provincetown and San Francisco went more or less equally claim uh, to be the place where that was invented, um, but it is sort of rooted in the idea of performance, that it is a performative drink. Um, but I'm going to encourage us all to think about the word cosmopolitan in something uh, closer to its original name, as somebody who is a citizen of the world. Um, and like I said, this is something I think about administratively, that I'm constantly encouraging people to learn other languages, uh, to contact other cultures, to think about the bonds we have with other human beings simply by being human, and to look at the difference we, differences we have and embrace them as opportunities for learning about how humans work and learning how we can interact, um, rather than by being a patriotist and being you know, thinking only of your one place. Um, and so I'm ripping out of context a quote from Terence, which has been ripped out of context ever since Cicero. Um, but homo sum humani ni alme ni ni ame alienum puto. So I've translated it pretty close to its meaning in its original context. Uh, it is, in fact, propounded by a busybody um, and says, I'm human, all humanity is my business. But very literally, in the way that people often take it, it says, I'm human. Nothing, I consider nothing human to be, and then alienum is a word that means literally belonging to somebody else. So I consider everything human to be not something that belongs to somebody else. In other words, it also belongs to me. Um, and so that is uh, what I'm encouraging with the word cosmopolitan. Thank you all. This was wonderful to be talk with you together, right? We share one mind, all three of you. Thank you so much for that. We have a little bit of time that people would like to hear people asking those all three words in the Whoever does better to watch this because I cannot in fact ask us to do that. Um so yeah, sorry, I'll come back up. Um so hi everyone. Um it's it's more just a provocation, but I'm just one thing that stood out across all three was this a kind of blurriness or complexity, complexity or messiness across, right? Like a transition, a difference across between. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, yeah, what do you think? What do you think? I have things to say. I don't know if it's smart. Right? How do you see it interacting? I'm sorry. What's it interacting? The like, transition? Yeah, and this messiness between 
in all of your work with the best. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have so much to say either, but uh, I, I do think, you know, uh, the nature of my work in this process of context is to create the messiness within the field itself, really. So uh, even to date, there is just recently an article published, you know, using the anachronistic card here, right, for our research. So there's been quite a bit of pushback on certain areas of Shakespeare studies, and primarily race studies of Shakespeare, where they suggest that using race and anachronistic, right, and thinking about the anachronistic, yes, there is a lot of water, it's not a legitimate way of thinking about these issues. Um, and yet there's quite a bit of flexibility when it comes to other contemporary words. And so I think in those ways, that has been on top of recent books, and that dragon has been studied, and we got it. There are still people making those claims. Uh, with all of that said, I think, you know, the cross historical nature of some of this work you know, creates those tensions, right, and thinking about, uh, you know, what, what, what we value, right, and how we how we tend to come. So what I've noticed in the collection is, is those that are historically situated are indeed trying to tease out the way that those modern would have thought about these particular issues here, right? How uh, they would have envisioned um, the value of animal skin, for example, here, right? Not as uh, something material to be sound, right? But ethically, right? And thinking about these big issues. Um, and we can put that in conversation through you know, our perspectives today, even in the quote that I used with, with Aaron Moore, right? Carving on a mad on the bark of trees, right? And I think psychologically too, what, what that means, right? And so I think the messiness is productive in a wonderful way to be uh, One, I just commenting on, on, on that in a second. One, one thing that is, uh, I, I, I will answer your question, I'm sorry, but, uh, but as I was as thinking about carving on skin, of course, I mean, I, so I, as I'm doing my current translation project, you know, I'm looking back at the manuscript, and, and a lot of times it's very easy to tell with manuscripts or parchments that is animal skin. I mean, that is that is why that is one of the reasons books are so expensive in the Middle Ages. Um, is you know the, the volume I'm I'm looking at, I, you know, a couple of herds of cattle were slaughtered to make that book, um, and that's anyway, it, and it comes through when you see veins in the pages. Things like that, but anyway, the um, messiness. I think messiness is one of the things humanity is really good at <laughs> um, in general, and that's you know people who there's there's a there's a rightful desire of people to look for solutions, um, and looking we're usually the ones who say I think it's all really <laughs> have, have you looked at this other thing, and 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 so we're we're often not the most welcome person at the party, um, but for all that, the more necessary um, solutions don't solve when you haven't taken into account the messiness. Um, and so uh, humanities folks problematizing the, the way that we talk about things um, is, yeah, I mean, it's really, that's that's one reason that universities are such a good thing, because we can all be in dialogue with one another if we're going to disagree, and thank goodness. <laughs> Thank you for talking to me. Um, I, in my current book project, I'm thinking about this messiness in terms of disciplinarity and the institution specifically, right? So I'm glad you brought up this idea of how humans like to, um, are good at being messy and being the perfect excuse because we, you know, make a mess. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about, right, we live in this time where interdisciplinarity is the, the, the key to are solving our problems, right? I, I think it's more uh, transdisciplinary now that is the word that we're thinking instead of interdisciplinary, which is defined as multiple, what I used to think of as multidisciplinary, right? The, the names are constantly, the, those themselves are messy, but um, the way that these disciplines interact is currently uh, that each discipline approaches one problem from its own perspective and thereby, you know, contributes its own perspective to that problem in order to solve it. And in fact, um, grants now are looking for interdisciplinary um, input in order to solve these problems in this sort of applied research mode of the middle of the university, right? So I, I really am trying to think about the way in which um, disciplines are actually more siloed when we have this 
supposedly interdisciplinary approach and how do we think the um, interdisciplinary I have one job and I can do it. Um, other questions? So I'm going to ask you this a little bit more. Um, and now this is what you want to know. Um, so I'm struck by how humanists will tend to quantum physics, sometimes another part of science, and essentially frame a metaphorical relationship to it. And it strikes me that that's not that you're insisting we don't satisfy ourselves with that. Um, that we grapple more with the with the science. Um, and I that's a difficult job, right? I mean, that strikes me as so um important and um sincere. Um, and also so difficult. So I was wondering if you would just talk about that. Yeah, as someone who definitely is not a scientist and has to sort of teach myself everything that I've done so far at a late stage in life, and yeah, it's difficult. Um, so some people do accept that metaphors are useful, and we borrow them all the time. I mean, we have like the whole notion of traveling concept, and we plucking things out and putting them in a new context changes them in some ways, and that's one way that humans often operate. There are others who, um, you know, some think that they're, some want to use metaphors, some think they're not using metaphors, others accuse them of not being uh, literal enough or um, enough. And so I think, uh, I mean, Barad is actually saying, they correct, um, for example, Michael Frank used in the uh, Copenhagen play uh, that, that his understanding of uncertainty is wrong. And if we had right, a correct understanding of uncertainty, then we could get a better ethic. Um, so there is a way in which some of these props, uh, these interdisciplinary works are, are saying, you need to have multiple literacy. You do need to understand each discipline well, and not to see these sort of dilettantes. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm not arguing that. <laughs> I will never understand science. Karen Broad is brilliant and does understand a lot, more than I do, um, in both fields. But I am interested in the way that each discipline sort of has its own truth, right? It has its own contribution to understanding, um, to framing the world and seeing it in a particular way. And so I, I'm interested more in the sort of um, epistemic diversity and how we can uh, the interplay of that rather than claiming accuracy or uh, mastery. We're about at time, and I'm sure the phrase epistemic diversity was it all like not we're just gonna have a at that. So that's a good way. Uh, so we go here. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.